Not all knights have their armor visible on the outside. Some of them have hidden layers, like an onion or Shrek. Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now first up, apologies for my voice, I'm recovering from a cold. But what we're gonna look at here is layers of armor on medieval knights. We're gonna stick within the medieval period, okay? You'll probably finish at the end of the 15th century. But there are examples which you could use after the 15th century as well. We're gonna look at examples where armor is present on a knight in uh, art, for example, but might not always be obvious, might not be visible. A famous example of that, of course, would be mail, often called chainmail in the modern world, worn underneath plate armor. But we'll look at some more specific examples here. But before we dive into this video, we're going to have a super quick word about our sponsors for this video, who very kindly are Mecarina. Mecarina is the awesome skill-based game that you can download onto your mobile right now using the link below or my QR code on screen. And you can get mechs that you can control, you can get pilots, you can upgrade their skills, you can upgrade all the weapons, the armor. It's a really fun game, and most importantly, it is skill-based. It's free to download and really quick to dive into and play. You can pull your phone out, play a quick game in five minutes, and you're done. The battle maps are timed and designed for quick, intense games. Each time you die, you respawn in another one of your mechs, so you get to do lots of different types of gameplay within one gaming set. Now, Mech Arena's got a ton of interesting things happening this month, including special Easter and Golden Week events. All you've got to do to get hold of new weapons and amazing new skins is simply take part. Mech is growing really quickly at the moment, and that means more fun and more people to fight. Mech is completely free to play on Android and iOS right now, and you you can use my personal link or scan my QR code on screen to get bonuses worth $45. We're talking about one Steel Reaper skin, 500 A coins and 70,000 credits to help kickstart your game right now. If you're quick, you can add me to your friends right now. My name's Context, of course, and we can play some matches together. So get going, download or using the link below or the QR code on screen. Okay, so starting out in the early uh, medieval period up to about 1000 AD, Generally speaking, if people had armor at this time, if we're talking about Western Europe anyway, then it's usually going to be a mail shirt and a helmet. And obviously you can see these things in art. They're, they're, they're there to see. They're clear to see. The only perhaps slight um, uh, anomaly or question remaining over armor and how it worked in this time is if we come forward to the Bayer Tapestry, for example, by this point, the fairly long male hauberk has become pretty well developed. Um, but there are some questions over what was under it. Now, many people watching this channel will be aware of the fact that male, okay, chain male, but I'll call it male, works best when there's a layer of uh, shock absorbency I won't say padding so much as some type of shock absorber underneath it. Now, there are re references in the Roman era to a subamalis or something that you wear underneath your armor to prevent chafing. And there's always been the question over, if we look at the Bayer Tapestry, for example, we see people being stripped of their male shirts and they've just got nothing underneath, well, clothes. Were people really at this time just putting a male shirt over their clothes? Well, it's possible because the clothes themselves if they're the right type of clothes, can provide some degree of shock absorbency and protection against the male. Was this what they were doing? We don't know. Is it possible that they were wearing some type of lightly padded or at least chafe preventing garment underneath the male? Yes, it's possible, but we have no evidence of it at all. So when people talk about things like gambesons in this period, they're not something that existed. Gambesons are something that come along a couple of hundred years, well, a hundred years later. Um, so they didn't exist in this period. So what were people wearing under mail? We don't really know. Is it possible that something was stitched to the inside of the mail so that any type of, um, you know, proto-gambeson, I suppose, under arming ga uh, garment, arming doublet, was worn underneath the mail but attached to the mail? So you took the whole lot off in one go. It's possible. But again, we have no evidence for that. So in this era, overall, it seems like there was no real hidden armor. So we really have to come forward uh, a couple of centuries till we get into the kind of uh, era of the Third Crusade, shall we say. So when we get to the late 1100s, we start to find references to hidden armor. Now in this era, by about 1200, a certain type of helmet called the Great Helm is starting to appear. And this is really the era during which we start to find 
um, sort of unequivocal uh, evidence of hidden armor in the form of the Cervelia or the um, arming steel cap, essentially, that goes underneath a great helm. So it's the proto bassinet. It's what the bassinet grew out of. But indeed, it was often worn underneath the mail as well. So very often when we see someone in a male coif, uh, you know, Hollywood would have assumed they're just wearing a male coif on their head, but they're not. They're wearing it at least over padding and very often over a steel skull cap, if you want to call it that. So you would have a steel cap to prevent from uh, blows coming down on your head. So if you take your great helm off, as was often done in this period and all the way up to the middle of the um, 13th century, so middle of the 1200s, often the great helm's taken off, but the Cervelia is still there to protect the head. And indeed, even if we just see a male coif, there'd be a Cervelia underneath that a lot of the time. And we can tell this from the particular shape of people's heads. So that's a fairly uncontroversial type of hidden armor that we know was being used at this time, but you can't always see it in the artwork. Now, apart from the aforementioned gambeson, which we know is being worn under male armor, there's another more controversial type of hidden armor, which we believe from the texts was starting to appear at this time. And we could loosely call this the breastplate. However, it's not a breastplate how you might think of it. So first of all, there are references in the around the time of uh, Richard the Lionheart, around the time of the Third Crusade, of breastplates. But we don't know exactly what that means. They're sometimes mentioned in reference to jousting, and they're sometimes referenced in mentions of war, and particularly the uh, looted equipment that is taken from the defeated enemy. Now, there is some chance that the introduction of chest defences was inspired by or directly taken from contact with the East, whether it's with the Mongols or whether it's um, the Byzantine Empire or whether it's contact with the um, Islamic forces who were fighting in the Crusades. It's entirely possible, but that's all conjectural at this point. The fact is that the texts sometimes make references to plates worn underneath the mail, or at the very least, worn underneath the surcoat. Now, this brings us on to another type of armour which may or may not be related to the breastplate, and that is the coat of plates. Now, the coat of plates is actually what I wrote my degree dissertation on, fascinating piece of armour. The coat of plates ultimately did develop into the cuirass, it did develop into the brigandine um, and it, other forms of um, articulated defence on the body, but particularly the brigandine. And essentially it's a series of plates around the body that protect for the, primarily the chest, also the lower abdomen, and many of them protected the back as well and certainly around the sides of the ribs at least. Now we only see this in some artwork occasionally because heraldic surcoats were worn over the top. So if you're wearing a heraldic surcoat, the artist is going to show the male arms, the male legs, and they're going to show the great helm or the uh, coif or the bassinet and um, cervelia if it's there. But they're not going to show the coat of plates for the most part because the coat of plates was hidden under the surcoat. So the study of the coat of plates was really thrown forwards a huge degree by the discovery of the 14th century mass graves, uh, battle mass graves from the Battle of Visby. But there are other coats of plates as well from Kusnak and elsewhere from the uh, 14th century. So what was going on in the 13th century? Well, we really have to look at artwork and we can look at effigies, we can look at uh, manuscript illuminations, and we get little clues here and there. And equally, the text, if we look at Claude Blair's um, European Armour book, which was a seminal uh, work on the study of European arms and armour, there are many mentions in sources of pairs of plates. Now, pairs of plates could refer to perhaps two plates on the front, they could refer to, uh, refer to a breast and a back plate. However, Pairs of plates and simply mentions of plates seem to, for the most part, refer to the coat of plates. And one of the most famous examples of this is a statue from, uh, or a figure rather, from uh, Germany showing St. Morris, who is a famous African saint, and St. Morris is shown in a coat of plates. And this gives us a clue of what the 13th century coat of plates looked like. And in this case, it's visible because this art has represented it, but in a lot of art, we do not see the coat of plates because it's hidden under the heraldic surcoat. However, we should assume that very often it was there, it was present. 
Okay, so when we're looking at 13th century and to some degree perhaps late 12th century uh, artwork, when we just see someone who appears to be fully encased in mail or chain mail with a great helm, very often we should assume that there's a good chance that they were wearing some type of hard plate uh, torso defence, very often a uh, coat of plates, perhaps sometimes a standalone small breastplate. Uh, this is conjectural. But very often there is a plate protecting the torso that you cannot see in the art. Now if we forward to the 14th century, many of the things we've said for the 13th century still apply. So very often great helms, certainly in the early part of the 14th century, great helms are shown, but we should assume, and it's often shown in art, that there's a bassinet underneath. So just because someone's wearing a great helm, don't assume they have a bare head underneath it. They would usually have a bassinet attached to a male aventail, sometimes a cervelier with a full male coif. Um, so that's underneath the helmet. Underneath whatever's shown on their body will often be a coat of plates or an early form of breastplate. And we know particularly in Germany, sometimes breastplates, standalone breastplates, which didn't have a back plate, were worn with a crisscross belt over the back, um, over the upper breast. And this was the precursor to the later breastplates uh, worn with a uh, folds overlapping uh, plates on the lower torso that we're more familiar with. So absolutely forms of breastplate and forms of coat of plates are often hidden underneath the heraldic garment. But in the 14th century, particularly in the later part of the 14th century, from about the 1360s or 70s onwards, and particularly prevalent in the 1380s and 1390s, it became very common to wear a type of arming coat or uh, outer garment, outer fabric garment, that had some light degree of padding to it, but not too much because you don't want to make yourself too hot, that was worn over the armour. And this gets quite confusing because people look at images and they assume that someone's just wearing a, a bassinet with a, with a breastplate and then they've just got padding on their arms, but they don't. That garment covers not only the plate arm defences, but also the, um, the mail that is worn underneath the plate arm defences. So in many cases, a person would wear a full mail shirt and plate defences and then a fabric garment over the top, hiding all of that armour. So particularly in the late 14th century and going into the early 15th century, it's not uncommon to see fully armoured plated knights, if we call them that, men at arms more correctly, uh, who appear to be wearing padded armour, but actually that's a fabric garment over plate armour, which in itself is over or worn in conjunction with male armour in the gaps between the plates as well. Now as we go into the 15th century, a lot of these trends continue. Male is often hidden underneath plate. Um, male and plate can sometimes be hidden underneath fabric. Um, and indeed, occasionally, when we see someone in a brigandine, for example, it has a male shirt underneath it. And we can usually see because we have male sleeves sticking out of the brigandine and a bit of male sticking out beneath the edge of the brigandine as well. So we know that a full male shirt or perhaps separate sleeves and skirt, because we know they were a thing as well to save weight, were worn underneath the brigandine or indeed underneath a plate cuirass in many cases. So this is probably the most common type of hidden armour worn in the 15th century. But we do find mentions to hidden armour as well. And in fact, in civilian life, there were some people who were afraid of assassination, um, various members of the Medici family in Florence, for example. And quite simply, they sometimes wore concealed armour. This often took the form of something like a brigandine, which was worn underneath the civilian clothes. And there's at least one account of someone being stabbed and the dagger not making it through the clothes because they were wearing hidden uh, brigandine underneath, but equally it could be a male shirt, so people could wear hidden male shirts underneath as well. So hidden armour worn in a civilian environment was also a thing. And then we also have a type of what's commonly called uh, in later period sources and in the modern world, a secret. Now this is essentially an iron or steel skull cap that goes underneath whatever you're wearing, like a hat or whatever. Um, so you can have essentially a skull cap helmet. It wouldn't take the full force blow of a pole axe, uh, but if someone's stabbing at your head with a dagger or even cutting with a sword, 
it will certainly be vastly preferable to not having anything in your head or only having a hat. So there were other types of hidden armour which were starting to come in at this time as well. We also start to read about male lined things and there are some references to male lined gloves. Um, so again it's deliberately concealed, deliberately hidden armour. Now although it's not exactly hidden, we could perhaps roll into this category as well, fabric covered armour. And this is something which people who are very into armour know all about, but isn't widely known outside of armour aficionados. And in the 15th century, particularly in the second half of the 15th century, as we go towards the 16th century, putting a fabric covering on armour became quite fashionable and quite common. It also has some practical uses. It reduces, for example, if the armour is very hot to touch, if you're in a hot country, then it gets rid of that problem or reduces that problem. It reduces maintenance issues to do with rust and things like that. It also means you can have bright colours on your armour, which for heraldic or if you want to show that people are in your retinue, if they all wear your colours on their helmets and on their brigandines and other bits of armour, then that's useful to you. So fabric covered armour, although it might not be strictly speaking concealed or hidden in art, very often when we look at art we might see someone wearing for example a salet helmet, particularly in Italy, and it might appear to be red or you know uh, blue or yellow or purple, and this is because it is fabric covered. They can be painted as well, but very often they're fabric covered in materials like velvet in order to show the colours of their lord. Now as we get right to the end of the 15th century and indeed into the early 16th century where, where I'm going to uh, end for this video, we do find increasingly the use of more lightly armoured soldiers on the battlefield and very often these wear very flamboyant clothes. The most famous examples being the Landsknechts um, and they often have these puff and slash clothing, that's more of a 16th century thing, but we start to see the beginnings of it at the end of the 15th century. And despite the fact that they are wearing these very elaborate um, uh, kind of, I won't say costumes, they're their clothes essentially, and they might be in the colours of the particular um, force that they're fighting for or the particular mercenary band that they fight for. Very often we see in the gaps of this clothing, we see mail, we sometimes see breastplates, so very often, it's another example of very often, you might see someone who just appears to be very fancily dressed with a big brimmed hat with pluming feathers and this kind of stuff. But when you look closer, you might see they have a male shirt, they might have a breastplate worn over the male shirt, they might have plate arm defences hidden underneath sleeves, this is quite common, and indeed under that big brimmed hat, they might have a steel secret protecting their head. And indeed, we also sometimes see, particularly for cavalrymen, a strip of mail sewn down the outside leg of the hose. So rather than just having fabric on their legs, they do actually have a strip of mail, chain mail, down the outside edge of their legs, which you could argue isn't concealed, but it's you kind of kind of wouldn't notice it at first glance. Anyway, I hope this has been thought-provoking um, and interesting. Maybe it will send you down some new avenues of research, or if you're a writer, um, or uh, you know you're making uh, video games or role-playing games, it might give you a bit more of an idea about you don't just have unarmored people and armored people. Sometimes you have people who are armored, but at first sight they might not look it, or they might not look as heavily armored as they actually are. Thanks a lot for watching. Check out the links below and all of that kind of stuff. And I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.